third class of uh, 32 classes in our Vipassana study. Um, and putting this course together um, was in interesting for me, and it caused me to think in ways that I maybe haven't before, to structure this in a way that each course will gently build uh, and deepen our understanding of this singular theme of the Dhamma is understanding the true nature of self, a stress-free self, in relation to a stress-inducing world and how to do that. And that really is the essence of the Dhamma. It's another way of saying it. Um, but that's, that's the whole point of the Buddha's teachings is to truly understand what it means to be a human being in a world that is prone to dukkha, to, dukkha, to, to stress and suffering and confusion and delusion and greed and aversion and all those things that follow from ignorance of Four Noble Truths. And ignorant Four Noble Truths simply describes the reality of human life. And so all we're doing is waking up to who we are. And I often describe what awakening means is simply having full human maturity, understanding who we are without the need for ourselves to be any different than we are, because we can't be. This is, this is, this is us. Great show, by the way. This is us. Um, the sutta I'm going to... Uh, read tonight the Arya Pariyasana Sutta um, is the sutta where the Buddha describes his own internal process of awakening and what he found to be useful and what he found to be simply more distracting. When we get into the, uh, and I'll point this out again, when we get to the, to the uh, reference to two of his most significant teachers and the, the Dharma, that uh, Dharma means teachings that are not what the Buddha taught, Dhamma is what the Buddha taught. Uh, they taught dharmas that were not what the Buddha was looking for. And the Buddha realized even prior to his awakening that these were simply speculative self-establishments in non-physical realms. I know that sounds a little bit um, maybe mystical or esoteric, but that's exactly what most spiritual practices have us do. And I'll, I'll talk about that more in a little bit. This is one of the most significant suttas because of the subject matter. Um, but also to understand the jumping off point for us in effect for our Dhamma study and why the Buddha taught what he did, why these three marks are so significant. Okay. Um, on one occasion, the Buddha was in Savati at Jita's Grove and Natha Pandika's monastery. That was a, a, a typical um, lodging for the Buddha for much of his career, not always. He adjusted his robes and taking his alms bowl, he left for town for his daily meal. A large group of monks approached Ananda. Ananda was the Buddha's um, cousin and his attendant for most of his life. A group of monks approached Ananda. It has been a long while since we heard a Dhamma talk from the great teacher. It would be for our long-term benefit to hear a Dhamma talk from the awakened one. Ananda replied, Venerable ones, perhaps if you went to the hermitage of Ramaka, you will get to listen to a Dhamma talk from the Buddha. Nanda is doing a little strategic planning here. We will do as you say, Venerable Ananda. The Buddha returned from alms, from alms and asked Ananda to accompany him to the Eastern Park in the palace of Megara's mother for the day's abiding. Then, having spent the day in seclusion, the Buddha asked Ananda to accompany him to the Eastern Gatehouse to bathe. Having bathed, Ananda said to his teacher, the hermitage of Ramaka is nearby. It is pleasant and delightful. There are many there awaiting your teaching. It would be a benefit to them if out of sympathy you were to go there. The Buddha agreed and they left for Ramaka's hermitage. As they approached, they heard a Dhamma discussion underway. The Buddha waited for the discussion to end. Hearing silence, he cleared his throat. I'm coming in and knocked to announce his arrival. Upon entering, he sat on a prepared seat and addressed the Sangha. So, as, as I, even in the beginning, when I started reading these suttas, the actual direct teachings of the Buddha, I just realized how remarkable it was and how fortunate we all are to have the spoken words of the Buddha still available to us from 2,600 years ago. And they're just as pure and just as direct as they ever, just as useful as they ever been. The Buddha says, 
for what discussion were you all gathered here? Great teacher, we were discussing you, and then you arrived. Wow. So if you ever want to see me show up, talk about that one. Good. It is fitting that you have gone forth from good families, from home to homelessness, and gather for the for Dhamma discussion. When you gather as a Sangha, you should always discuss the Dhamma or practice noble silence, just like we do in our retreats most of the time. Friends, there are two types of searching for understanding. There is ignoble searching and noble searching. And what is ignoble searching? Ignoble searching occurs when a person subject to birth seeks happiness in what is also subject to birth. It doesn't, the Buddha is not talking about a, a strictly a physical birth, although that's the, the component of it. Birth in this sense is simply a, an engagement in a world that we really don't understand. We are born into this world in a practical matter, in a physical matter. But then because of a misunderstanding and creating fabricated views, we are constantly giving birth to additional fabricated views that, can, that are only prone to confusion, polluted thinking, and ongoing suffering. Is that you, Rom? Wow, what a nice picture. Look, are you in front of a fireplace? <laughs> in front of a fire. Candles, okay. <laughs> what a nice view. Um, and what is also subject to birth. In other words, the, the, the broader understanding of that sentence is that if we are constantly stuck in our fabricated views, ignorant of four noble truths, the only thing we can give birth to is another fabricated view, another moment rooted in that ignorance. And so we're to search within ignorance, the ignorance that we have given birth to is what the food is really referring to. We can't expect to find any wisdom if we're only looking where ignorance prevails. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. And that points directly to ending the, the search for understanding as an external search or as an external salvation, meaning if I do enough of the right things or the right rituals or this or that, um, at some future point, I'll be granted awakening or peace or safety or whatever you might want to describe that as or even within your practice to think that there's an external application to what you're understanding. This one sentence points us to realize what are we giving birth internally, the not self-characteristic, that, that middle part of the three marks of existence, impermanence and not self-characteristic and the resulting dukkha. I'm skipping over some comments. The Buddha continues, ignoble searching occurs when a person subject to sickness seeks happiness in what is also subject to sickness. The, when the Buddha describes dukkha, he describes it in, in just this way, that birth is suffering, sickness is suffering, aging is suffering, death is suffering. Not getting what is desired is suffering, receiving what is undesired is suffering. These are, these are common characteristics of a human life, isn't it? Why does it take a profound, profoundly awakened human being to point the obvious out to us? Because we want to ignore that. That's the essence of ignorance is, is to ignore what's actually occurring. And because of that, we create great confusion, ongoing deluded thinking, and, and, and self-induced stress, meaning the stress is provoked by our own lack of understanding. It's not something that is inherent in the world, meaning that we can overcome it. And the reason why I'm saying that, again, is to point back to this central theme. It's up to me. All of this is occurring to me. And none of it is personal. And we're going to, I'm not going to get too deep into that because that's, we're going to get in, we're going to develop that whole idea as we move through this. And the, um, the awakened view is just that. There's nothing that I can possibly take as personal. And so I'm going to maintain a calm and peaceful mind. Sounds simple, and it is actually once we get to that understanding. Um, so this this ignoble search relates to that relates directly to dukkha. If we're looking within what is the cause of suffering or within suffering itself, we can't expect to gain any understanding. And this also points to this idea of analysis of suffering, analysis of our feelings, analysis of our thoughts. Um, even the uh, it's often heard. I often hear it within modern. Uh, Buddhist circles and modern spiritual circles that we should embrace our suffering. We should go deep into our suffering. And there's, there's no value in embracing our suffering. In fact, that is the, 
the surefire way to continue being joined with our suffering by treating it that way. It's simply to be recognized and then to understand the underlying cause of our stress and suffering is ignorance of four noble truth. It points directly to the solution rather than constant analysis, which is simply encouraging constant clinging to wrong views. We get to the heart of the matter, understanding who I am in relation to the world around me. Ignoble searching occurs when a person subject to aging seeks, seeks happiness in what is also subject to aging. Ignoble searching occurs when a person subject to death seeks happiness in what is also subject to death. That could seem like a pretty obscure reference, but what does it mean? It means we're looking for eternal salvation within this life that has one culmination, death. For each and every human being, nobody can escape it. It's part of that, it's part of the, the deal of being a human being. Life carries an inherent death sentence. We need to understand that. One of the reasons why that's so important is if I understand that in the next moment, my opportunity for awaken may be gone to awaken, I better get to it. It helps prioritize that to understand this. And in this, in this cycle of from birth, physical birth to physical death is where we suffer. If we look for salvation within what is prone to suffering, we can only continue suffering. And the, that, that relates, it, it, it gets to very subtle levels, but that relates to external searches and external uh, salvation. There's nothing outside of us that can bring us understanding and peace and calm. It's a completely inside job, job and it resolves in that middle mark. Ignoble searching occurs when a person is subject to sorrow, regret, pain, distress, despair, to greed, to aversion, to delusion, seeks happiness in what is also subject to sorrow, regret, pain, distress, despair, to greed, to aversion, and delusion. That speaks directly to the idea of analyzing our feelings and our thoughts and the occurrences of our life and where do they come from and why do I feel this way and who's to blame and, and, and actually getting to the place in our minds where we feel like we've lost control because we aren't in control of what's occurring to us, are we, to the most part? And that can cause some great anxiety. In fact, in many people it does. To understand that none of that is personal except how we receive these things. How our view of our life as our life unfolds is. And if our view is aligned with reality, there's no stress, there's no suffering, there's no greed or aversion. That's it. So we're going deep into it. There's no need and it's just a distraction. And so what is subject to birth? This is really, this is very, uh, this next section points to not that some of these subjects that I'll mention in a minute are somehow bad or hurtful. It's by our attachment to these things that I'm about to talk about, that these be different than they are or maintain a certain quality in our mind that causes stress and suffering, and it causes divisiveness between these subjects. What is subject to birth? Spouses and children are subject to birth. When we create an identity that is intertwined with our spouses, with our partners, with our children, as an identity, as, as a part of me, what are we doing? What are we setting ourselves up for? Disappointment. And isn't it true that our biggest disappointments come, most of us, through the people that we care the most for, isn't it? And that is because in a general way, because we want them or the situation to be different than they are. Better kids, you know, better spouse, whatever it might be. Um, but it's not saying that we shouldn't have a spouse or shouldn't have a children. It's simply saying we should see them in the same reality we see ourselves to understand that. So we enjoy our families, but we don't make our happiness dependent on them. Could get way off on that. Men and women slaves are subject to birth. Obviously, there was still slavery, but even well, was still slavery in our lifetime, wasn't it? Isn't there? Um, but even that attachment to having that type of involvement is subject to birth. There's no permanence there. Animals of, of all types are subject to birth. Gold and silver, meaning material wealth, are subject to birth. 
don't cling to any of these things. Don't create an identity over any of them, or you're going, you're, you're creating a fabricated existence. When these are seen as acquisitions, one becomes attached and infatuated with these acquisitions. Seeking happiness with what is subject to birth is an ignoble search. All of those things just described are subject to birth, meaning they're impermanent. They arise at certain times and they pass away. Excuse me. Including things that we think are more permanent, such as gold and silver, material wealth. We all know that that is impermanent, no matter how we might want to manipulate that. For most of us, our... our our back pocket is sometimes thick and sometimes it's not so thick. It's just the nature of life. But when we create an identity over that, we're prone to sick to, to, to suffering. I remember years ago uh, when I first started out in business, I guess I was in my mid twenties and pretty quickly I got somewhat successful in the roofing, siding business, general construction. And I noticed something pretty curious to me as I started making money that when I had a nice fat bank account, and at that time it was probably $4,000, it was a lot of money to me. When I had you know, a nice little pile of money, I felt better about myself and the world around me. And it took me a while to understand that. And it was a cycle. When you know, th things occurred and the bank account got a little bit lower and I had to worry maybe about how I'm gonna pay next month's bills, I didn't feel so good about myself. And I didn't feel so good about the world around me. I was tense. I mind get a little bit upset at people for no reason. And then again, when a nice fat check came in, a job got done, I felt great about myself again. And it took me, it took me until I got into Dharma practice to realize the condition that I set on my life. It was bait, my happiness and my security was based on how thick my wallet was. It's an awful way to live, to, to place my happiness, my peace of mind on something that is always changing. And we do that with all kinds of things. We do do it with our spouses and our children and our homes and our cars and our jobs and the golf courses we belong to and the canasta clubs we're part of and the bowling league. We're, all of those things we create identities of. And when we start clinging to them as something that we need to be happy and secure, we're setting ourselves up for constant distraction and constant stress and suffering. My comment here, identifying anything as me or mine or joining with by clinging to any object, event, thought, or an idea is an acquisition. And ultimately it is what we're clinging to in our thoughts because that, that's where everything is resolved. We can have all the physical objects in our life and as long as we're not attached to them, that's not, a, that won't be a problem, but ultimately this is resolved between our ears in our thoughts. And clinging to fabricated thoughts rooted, rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths is what manifests, is what we're truly giving birth to in each moment and what we should recognize and abandon. Is that last clear? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about external um, clinging, but ultimately it's simply clinging to wrong views that we're hoping to resolve and that we will resolve. Wishing for permanence in what is inherently impermanent, this is my words again, my commentary, Wishing for permanence in what is inherently impermanent is rooted in craving, aversion, and deluded thinking, the three defilements that arise from ignorance of these three marks of existence. In other words, understanding what this whole course is about will bring to an end greed, aversion, and any deluded thinking. It resolves here. You know, I wanted to make a... Sorry. You want me to hold on for a minute? No, that's okay. You can hear? I, I was thinking about this. When I... When I, I know I, I have... You know, nobody's ever commented on my hand movements and my strings, gestures, but you can. When I'm doing this, I'm not saying that this, it's in your heart, like in, you know, everything is, has to be resolved. It's just within my, within our bodies is where this is resolved. Okay, not, it's not something that you gotta be heartfelt or anything like that. The Buddha continues, likewise, these are all subject to sickness, to aging, to death, to sorrow, regret, pain, distress, despair, to greed, to aversion, to delusion, Period. Seeking happiness with what is subject to sorrow, regret, pain, distress, despair, to greed, aversion, to delusion is ignoble searching. In other words, any time, any external search or a search that has um, external qualities as a final resolution is an ignoble search. Again, that, the, 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 whole, the whole real point of this sutta, and you could say the whole Buddha's Dharma, is to say, stop looking outside of yourself. Stop creating rites and rituals. Stop creating special 
meditation practices or beliefs or visualizations or following a certain God or certain chants, all of those are something that the Buddha said don't do because they're external searches. Is that clear to everyone? Yeah. Okay. And also the accommodations that we make, not just Good searching point. out different, but adding things to subtracting things. Yes, thank you for saying that. What David is referring to is the, the Buddha taught a complete and pure Dhamma. When our fabricated views rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths want to attack, even in the smallest way, the Dhamma falls. Doesn't mean we can't do it or we might want to do it. It's simply not Dhamma practice. And that really is a difficulty that began during the Buddha's time and has continued for 2,600 years. This desire to continue to ignore ignorance by creating a so-called spiritual practice that really bears no resemblance to what the Buddha actually taught, but thinking that we're doing something now. But isn't that the essence of ignorance? We all create strategies that allow us to continue to ignore ignorance. That's the, that's the main component of the word and the abstract experience of ignorance ongoing ignorance it, it's a self-perpetuating myth when we're rooted in that not a myth it's a self-perpetuating experience that we constantly recreate through condition think he, he taught an eightfold path for the sole purpose to recognize and interrupt ignorance and think about that a mind that's rooted in ignorance is prone to deluded thinking how would a mind that is that way recognize that it is deluded and rooted in ignorance. It can't. It needs a way of looking at itself, looking within from a framework that is able to provide that recognition. That's what the proper meditation method, right meditation is for, and the entire Eightfold Path. So we see this internal process that we're doing. Nothing is happening to us except what we say we want to have. And Buddha continues. And what is noble searching? Getting to the heart of it now. Noble searching is while being subject to birth, meaning while being stuck in this, it, but while being stuck in dukkha, while being stuck in wrong views in relation to the world, that's where the resolution is. That's the whole point of this. And where is that? It's within us again. He has that reference to the heart. Let me go back again. Noble searching is while being subject to birth, seeking to understand the suffering of birth, seeking the unborn, meaning unborn doesn't mean. Um, developing a state where we're eternal. It, it simply means that we've developed the wherewithal and the understanding within us to not give birth to another moment rooted in ignorance. That's the unborn state that we're, the Buddha is talking about that has been taken to very magical and mystical teachings that have nothing to do with what the Buddha taught because it doesn't resolve within us. Seeking the unborn and the unexcelled release of the yoke, the, the yoke meaning the, the yoke of being bound to ignorant views, the suffering that is part of that. The unbinding, this is noble searching. My comments, unbinding from views rooted in ignorance of four noble truths. The Buddha continues, noble searching is while being subject to sickness, to aging, to death, to sorrow, regret, pain, distress, despair, to greed, to aversion, to delusion, to seek, seeking what is free of sickness, of aging, of death, free of sorrow, regret, pain, distress, despair, free of greed, aversion, and delusion. This is noble searching. So I think everybody, does everybody follow that? Just tell me if you need clarity. I'm just curious about that. Do we need clarity on this? You're gonna get it anyway. What you... No, it really, does everybody follow that? I, you need to say yes or no. I can't say yes. if you're gesturing. Okay, here it comes. <laughs> The Buddha is saying again that within this, within these three marks of this existence, within a misunderstanding of self and a misunderstanding and a clinging relation to the external world is where we resolve this. Meaning that we don't have to, we don't have to, and we shouldn't try to get to a, a comfortable and familiar space in our mind where we're now ready for Dhamma practice. Is everybody following me? Dhamma practice begins wherever we are, 
whatever situation that we are in, no matter how confused or distracted or agitated or anxious our minds are. That's what the Buddha is saying. No matter what your condition is, we condition, decondition it through the Eightfold Path. Excuse me. And all of this is to remind us salvation occurs. And I don't want to use that word because it has religious kind of understanding occurs where ignorance once was. And how could it be any different? As it, it's everything is occurring within this body, and this and at one point this body is rooted, this body and mind is rooted in ignorance. How else could we address it except at that point? At the point of ignorance. Again, that has that we talk often about integrating the eightfold path. That's what this means. To integrate the eightfold path inwardly, apply the principles that the Buddha is teaching us inwardly. And, res and, and resolve ignorance, resolve wrong views of self. Noble searching is seeking the unexcelled and release of the yoke, the unbinding. This is noble searching, just to reiterate that point. I'm going to skip over some commentary. Understanding stress, meaning understanding dukkha. Ah, wait a minute, let me go back. I have to, I have to read my comments. Unbinding from views rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths is awake and right view. And this is what that is. This, this is out of the sutta that we're talking about. Right view is understanding stress, understanding dukkha. Understanding the origination of stress, ignorance of Four Noble Truths. Understanding the cessation of stress, awakening, understanding that, understanding and abandoning ignorance. And right view is understanding the path leading to the cessation of stress meaning we understand the Eightfold Path. These four relate directly to the Four Noble Truths, if you haven't picked up about that. Understanding stress, the first noble truth is there is stress, there is dukkha. Understanding the origination of stress, which is craving for and clinging to self-referential views to the world that are rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths. Understanding the cessation of stress means we have the direct experience of that. And then understanding the Eightfold Path how do we understand anything? We develop a knowledge of it. So it's not just reading it or hearing about it. It's actually developing it is how we understand anything. Friends, before my self-awakening, this is such an important line, before my self-awakening, again, the Buddha is telling us that this is an inside job. It's a self-awakening job. Before my self-awakening, when I was still an unawakened bodhisattva or bodhisattva, and I, you know, I just need to comment here, the major Buddhist religions, particularly the Mahayana path, all talk about that as being the bodhisattva path. The bodhisattva means, and there's some various, uh, various ways of interpreting, but all basically the same, is that I am going to put off my awakening until all sentient beings are awakened. And, that's, and that is the primary Mahayana path. I'm not putting it down, but it contradicts what the Buddha said. But prior to his awakening, when he was unawakened bodhisattva, what he means by, what, it, what he means by that is he was an, a human being imbued with great compassion for other human beings, like most of us are. But because of his confused state, he didn't know what to do with it. It was only after his awakening that he could now express that compassion and in a way that is rooted in wisdom. So a bodhisattva path is a path that is rooted in the same ignorance that we're talking about. The idea that somehow I can, I can put aside my awakening, but then when all beings are awakened, I'll be magically awakened, contradicts the first noble truth, the basic teaching here. People aren't stuck in dukkha, stuck in ignorance because of some missing magical or mystical part to the universe or because I'm not yet awakened. People suffer because of ignorance of four noble truths. It's an ongoing <coughs> continuous ignorance. It's not something that's imposed on us. So when I was unawakened bodhisattva, being subject to birth, to sickness, to aging, to death, to sorrow, regret, pain, distress, despair, to greed, to aversion, to delusion, I was seeking happiness in what is subject to birth, to, to sickness, the aging, to death, to sorrow, regret, pain, distress, despair, to greed, to aversion, and delusion. My comment. This one statement clearly describes a distraction inherent in common 
Mahayana Buddhist practices of practicing the Bodhisattva path. Because once you take that, that, that path, you're no longer practicing an Eightfold Path. They're not complementary. You know, you, you can't be a Bodhisattva and be practicing the Eightfold Path. They just don't work because of the underlying philosophy. Another take on that, on the Bodhisattva ideal is that all beings are, were, how do I say this? When the Buddha awakened, all human, all beings awaken. That's a common refrain. And then the thing is, well, we just don't know it yet. Of course, the Buddha never taught that. And if that was true, then the Buddha was a, was a savior, not a teacher, something he never set himself out to be. And it also then takes the responsibility away from myself for awakening, doesn't it? The Buddha awakened, I'm good to go. I can do anything I want. Even though I'm, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm prone to greed, aversion, and deluded thinking and ongoing disappointing experiences. But many people hang, hang their hat on that. The Buddha taught something completely different. He taught an eightfold path that each individual develops to end their own ignorance. The Buddha continues. Then the thought occurred to me, why do I, being subject myself to birth, to sickness, to aging, to death, to sorrow, regret, pain, distress, you know, from now on, I'm going to just say to dukkha, to greed, to aversion, to delusion, seek what is likewise subject to dukkha. What if I, being subject to birth, were to seek to understand the suffering inherent in birth? That's something that nobody ever thought of before, or at least never applied it to themselves. What if I sought to understand the nature of suffering rather than try to find some external means to relieve me of my suffering? Where is it coming from? Eventually, the Buddha realized it's coming from within. Seeking the unborn and the unexcelled release of the yoke, the unbinding. Skipping over some commentary. What if I, being subject to sickness, to dukkha, and to greed, to aversion, to delusion, were to seek understanding of the suffering of dukkha? What if I were to seek the unborn and the unexcelled release of the yoke? Unborn meaning nothing left to provoke ignorance, being free of ignorance. My commentary. Siddhartha Gautama here is describing the thought process prior to going forth into homelessness. These are the things that were confusing him. So at a later time, while still a young man, he was 29 at the time, black haired, early in my life, my parents crying, I shaved off my hair, put on a robe made of rags, and went forth from home to homelessness. He started his spiritual search. I'm sorry, at the age of 26, I think I said 29. Having gone forth, seeking understanding of these things, seeking what is skillful, seeking unexcelled and lasting peace, I went to Alara Kalama. Alara Kalama was a very, uh, one of the most advanced teachers of his time by reputation, and he was teaching a, a variant of a dharma based on the Vedas and the Upanishads, the precursor to modern Hinduism. And even though Buddha is, the Buddha is claimed by many to be a yogi and a Hindu, he clearly dismissed those teachings as not leading to his goal. Again, it's not a put down on the Hindu religion. It's just something the Buddha studied and rejected. Uh, I went to Alara Kalama. On arrival, I said to him, friend Alara, I want to practice your dharma, your dharma and discipline. I want to become your disciple. Alara said to me, you may stay. My dharma is such that an observant person can soon understand and integrate my knowledge and realize it for themselves through their own direct knowledge. That's an important theme that even though Alara was teaching something that can be developed through their own direct knowledge, the underlying wisdom wasn't there. The Buddha continues, from reciting and repetition, I quickly learned his dharma. I could affirm that I knew it. I thought that, that it is not through the, the mere conviction that Alara Kalama declares that I understand and have integrated his dharma and realized it for myself through direct knowledge. Alara Kalama certainly understands and has integrated this dharma. Meaning Alara Kalama was as sincere as any teacher could be. He wasn't trying to mislead anybody but what was lacking was true understanding in Alara Kalama. So I went to Alara and asked him, what is the culmination of your understanding and integration of this Dharma? Alara declared that the culmination of his Dharma was establishment in the dimension of nothingness, that, which is a common 
teaching rooted in the, the Vedas and one of the most common teachings in modern Buddhism, something the Buddha rejected 2,600 years ago. The resolution of self into the realm of nothingness or emptiness is, again, one of the most common resolutions of the Dharma. And the implication then, the misunderstanding of what the self is, anatta, to take, it, to take the translation from not self to no self, which is what most people land on. And so it resolves this idea, this misunderstanding of self, not in a way that brings understanding, but as an escape. Oh, the, the self is nothing. The self is empty. That's not what the Buddha taught, did he? He taught that the self is everything. And so creating a, a dharma that establishes the self in a realm of nothingness is simply a speculated, speculative continuation of self-establishment in an imagined realm. There's no reality to it, no matter how much we want to talk about realms of nothingness and infinite space and infinite consciousness and infinite emptiness. Just because we think about it and decide that, okay, I thought about it, it must be true, doesn't make it true. In fact, it makes it an ongoing distraction prone to con continued suffering. Then I had the thought, not only does Alara Kalama have conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment, I also have conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment. What if I were to strive to realize for myself this Dharma through direct knowledge? Listen to these words from the Buddha. I quickly developed understanding and fully integrated Alara, Kalama, Alara Kalama's Dharma, having realized for myself the dimension of nothingness through direct knowledge. It sounds like, well, how did he do it? How did he get into this realm of nothingness? He, he, he understood it through direct knowledge. He understood that the realm of nothingness is nothing. There's no value to it. That's what he's referring to. And so, I then asked Alara if this was the culmination of his understanding and integration of this Dharma, meaning is this, is this all you got? Alarma told me that this was the culmination of his understanding and integration of his dharma. He then said that it was a great gain for his sangha to have a companion such as myself in their sangha. He then asked me, meaning he asked the Buddha, to lead their sangha together, which was an incredible honor. Anybody that would be asked to be to represent Alara Kalama and later Dekarama Puta, we'll get to him in a moment, that was one of the biggest honors anybody could get. If you want an instant recognition instant gravitas, you're going to say yes real quick. But Duda was, the, the, Duda, the Buddha wasn't concerned about that. He wanted an understanding. He said, Alara Kalama, my teacher, placed me on the same level as himself, paying me great honor. But I had the thought that this dharma does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation of, of ignorance, to stilling, to direct knowledge, to self-awakening, or to unbinding from wrong views. It's simply, well... This Dharma only seeks to establish a reappearance in the dimension of nothingness, meaning a speculative non-physical existence that is insisted upon by your very Dharma teaching, meaning, excuse me, the Dharma itself that, that the Buddha was studying and mastered, he realized that it was designed to continue to distract you towards continued ignorance. No matter how wonderful the teachings sound, no matter what they were based on, no matter the teacher, if the teacher is still rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths, he can only teach something. Even though it sounds magical and mystical, we attain the dimension of nothingness. But think about that. Do any of you want to, want to spend the rest of your existence in a realm of nothingness? Years and years ago, I got a, a phone call. I've talked about this here. Um, from a guy down in Newtown. He never did come to class, but he, he called me up. He must have came across me on the internet or something. And I could instantly tell that he was in a panic in his voice. And he told me his story. He said, I, I think I remember all the details. He was a 32 year old guy. He's got a beautiful family, beautiful house in Newtown, two cars in the garage, all this stuff. And he said, and I've been a meditator for 18 years. And, I, and he says, I have all these things. My life is wonderful. I got everything I could want. And he said, I feel like I have nothing. I can't, I don't know what's wrong with me. And I said, well, describe your meditation practice. And I knew what he was going to say before I even asked. He says, well, I, I start my meditation. I focus on nothing. I said, I can't remember his name. I said, say that again. He says, I start my meditation and I focus on nothing. And I could hear the light bulb go off in his head through the phone. He said, holy, shh. 
he understood immediately that he, what he was focusing on was establishing himself in nothing. And what did he experience in his life? Nothing. It's only a fabricated existence, but it can be extremely debilitating to grasp after nothingness or emptiness or any type of annihilation of self. It completely contradicts what the Buddha taught. And if you think about this idea of establishing myself in these different realms, it's completely outside of myself, isn't it? It has nothing to do with gaining an internal understanding. I found this Dharma unsatisfactory, and so I left Alara Kalama and continued the noble search. As I continued the search, I went to Udaka, Udaka Ramaputta. Upon arrival, I told him, friend Udaka, I want to practice your Dharma and discipline to become your disciple. Udaka, you, you reply, Udaka replied, you may stay. My Dharma is such that an observant person can soon understand and integrate my knowledge and realize it for themselves through their own direct knowledge. From reciting and repetition, I quickly learned his dharma. I could affirm that I, affirm that I knew his dharma. I thought that it is not through mere con conviction that Udaka Ramaputta declares that I understand and have integrated his dharma and realized it for myself through direct knowledge. Udaka Ramaputta certainly understands and has integrated this dharma. So I went to Udaka and asked him, what is the culmination of your understanding and integration of this dharma? Udeka declared that the culmination of his dharma was establishment in a dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. And who knows what that means, but that was a, it's another uh, speculative self-establishment in a imaginary realm, the, the realm of neither perception nor non-perception. It doesn't really need more of an in-depth explanation, except it's a fabricated realm. And as we continue this course, there's going to be quite a few other sutras where the Buddha cautions against doing just that. Stop establishing yourself outside of your own mind and outside of your own body. The Buddha continues, then I had the thought, not only does Udaka Ramaputta have conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment, meaning he's completely sincere in what he's teaching. I also have conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment. What if I were to strive to realize for myself this Dharma through direct knowledge? I quickly developed understanding and fully integrated Udeka Ramaputta's Dharma. Having realized it for myself, the dimension of nothingness through direct knowledge and the direction of neither perception or non-perception, I then asked Udeka if this was the culmination of his understanding and integration of his Dharma. Udeka told me that this was the culmination of his understanding and integration of his Dharma. He then said that it was a great gain for his Sangha to have a companion such as myself and their Sangha. He then asked me to lead their Sangha together. The Buddha replied, Udeka Ramaputta, my teacher, my teacher placed me on the same level as himself, paying me great honor. But I had the thought that this Dharma does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to stilling, to direct knowledge, to self-awakening, or to unbinding. This Dharma only seeks to establish a reappearance in the dimension of nothingness or the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. And you could, there's a, you could go on with a list of this, the, the dimension of infinite space, the dimension of infinite consciousness are often, you know, these speculative realms that are mentioned, but any speculated imaginary existence, such as the idea that I'm going to be the world's greatest Buddhist or the world's greatest meditator or the world's greatest baker or the world's greatest teacher, all of those are fabricated views of self. And they're just as distracting and debilitating to live within that fabrication as imagining yourself in a realm of nothingness or infinite consciousness. They're simply, you're, you've taken your mind and intentionally lost it in these other dimensions. The only way to get it back, as the Buddha found, is through an eightfold path. Again, just cross, uh, getting up past some commentary. The Buddha continues. I found this Dhamma unsatisfactory, and so I left Udaka Ramaputta and continued the noble search. Seeking the unexcelled peace arising from skillful understanding, I wandered through the Magadan country and arrived in Uruvela. This place was delightful with inspiring forest, a clear flowing river with shallow banks and nearby villages for alms. This seemed just right for developing jhana, for developing concentration. 
Friends, while practicing jhana, being subject to birth, to sickness, to aging, to death, to sorrow, regret, pain, distress, despair, to greed, to aversion, to delusion, I realize the unborn and the <laughs> unexcelled release of the yoke, the unbinding. Knowledge and vision arose within me. Unprovoked is my release, meaning there's nothing left to hold him back. There's nothing left to provoke further ignorance. Unprovoked is my release. This is the last birth. An important line. This points directly to the Buddha's teachings on birth and rebirth and that have very little, not completely nothing, but very little to do with the physical cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. Those are almost entirely inconsequential or and irrelevant to what the Buddha is teaching. What he's referring to again is there's nothing left within him now to give birth to another moment rooted in ignorance. That's the most important teaching on birth and rebirth within the Buddha's Dhamma. And this last line clarifies it. This is the last birth. There is now no further becoming. And in reference to becoming, it, it means, in fact, it relates to the title of the book and really what we teach. There's hardly, there's never a qualifier after that word becoming even independent origination. But what it means in the proper context, there's nothing left within him that would provoke becoming further ignorant. And that points directly to the immediacy of the Dhamma practice right here, right now. Each moment of our human life holds the potential towards awakening. And it also holds the potential, as we just learned, within, within dukkha, within ignorance, it also holds the potential to continue ignorance. That is the, 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 the paramount question of each moment of our lives. And that doesn't mean we should be hyper-focused on it. But every moment of our lives, we have an opportunity to continue awakening by holding in mind the Eightfold Path as best we can, or in continuing to ignore our own ignorance, and so to continue suffering. That really is the only choice we do have. But as Dhamma practitioners, we learn how to integrate that in a very gentle and gradual way. And, and is that correct? I mean, that's how you, you that have developed, you, all of you have been here long enough to answer that question. That's how it's been for you, isn't it? A gentle integration of the Eightfold Path. It's not something that you have to do. I mean, if you can get it done in 10 minutes, great. But most people won't. Most people will take, you know, a few weeks or a few years. What's the difference? Because every moment that we actually have united our mind and our body and are inclined towards awakening, the culmination is assured. It's only by losing our way that we'll lose that possibility. There is now no further becoming. Then I had the thought, this Dhamma that I have attained is deep, hard to see and hard to realize. This Dhamma is peaceful, refined, and beyond mere conjecture, such as the conjecture of establishing non-physical realms for myself. This Dhamma is subtle and is to be directly experienced by the wise. But the, and where, do we, where, where is the only place we can have a direct experience of something? Everybody answer in unison. Where is the only place we can have a direct experience of our life? Within ourselves. Yeah. In this moment. Yeah. Here. Right here, in our, within ourselves and in this moment. It's the only place. That is the only place that the Dhamma can be practiced, by the way. It's also the only place, the only point in, in time and in reference in our own minds that we can actually live our life. The reason why dukkha occurs is because our minds are conditioned to be stuck in the past or because of past conditioning projected out of this moment and into the next moment or the next week or the next lifetime. Those are all fabricated. Even the next moment is a fabricated thought. And when I'm dragging my past into the present, forcing my, my mind into the future, what am I doing? I'm simply continuing to be provoked by ignorance. But through a well-concentrated mind, I can now, even if it's momentarily at first, bring my mind into my body and look at what's occurring from the right framework through the Eightfold Path. And that's the beginning of awakening. It's the beginning of wisdom. It can only begin there, folks. And that's the whole point of this. And you've all been doing it. As a Sangha, we've been doing just this. And now it's time to put this final focus on this is really where we're doing it within ourselves. There's nothing outside of ourselves that will bring us resolution. The Buddha continues, but the world, the lights and attachment, 
It is excited by attachment or clinging. It is devoted to attachment and worships attachment. And don't we? Don't we worship the things that in, in that way? Don't we worship the things that we are attached to? In fact, often we'll elevate the need for getting the things that we feel we need above our own well-being. We'll sacrifice ourselves to get the things that we think we need to be happy rather than realize there's nothing that I can add to myself. Not add to myself to make myself happy. There's nothing that I can ever add to myself. We'll get to this a little bit later on. The Buddha taught that each and every human being has only six properties. Earth, wind, fire, water, the space property to allow this to manifest within, and that sixth, that sixth property of consciousness. And it is that consciousness that, that is animating the other five properties. And so if that consciousness that's animating these properties is rooted in ignorance, what is the five properties then experience? A life rooted in ignorance. If that consciousness is rooted in wisdom of four noble truths and now animating those five properties, that's a human being who is awakened and lives in constant peace and calm, no matter what occurs. Not a bad deal, huh? The Buddha continues, for a world delighting in attachment, excited by attachment, devoted to attachment, worshiping attachment, conditioned towards self-identification from dependence on ignorance, this Dhamma is hard to see. Again, the Buddha is just he's reiterating the point that because you're root, the Dhamma itself is not difficult, but from a mind rooted in ignorance, conditioned towards ignoring its own ignorance, it is hard to see, and I would bet all of you would agree with that. Do you see that this is what you're we're struggling with as you develop the Dhamma hmm. is just this, just this veil of ignorance that we've created ourselves from seeing reality. There's no substance to it, but because of clinging, because of holding on to these views that we're not willing to let go of, even in Dhamma practice, we create stress for ourselves. That's why you'll always hear me say the key to developing a Dhamma is to be very, very gentle with yourself at all times and be very gentle with the Buddha's Dhamma. Just keep it authentic and continue and you'll develop this the buddha continues the awakened state is also hard to realize the awakened state is hold on folks if you're wondering about what we're doing here the awakened state is the resolution of all fabrications and dependent origination we're going to do that saturday dependent origination states from ignorance of four noble truths are the requisite condition for fabrications fabrications are simply a fabricated or corrupted or perverted view of myself in relation to the world. The essence of ignorance. I don't know who I am. It all resolves in understanding who we are and who I am. The res resolution of all fabrications, the relinquishment of all acquisitions. It doesn't mean that if we happen to find ourselves in a big house with a big pile of gold, we have to get rid of it all. It simply means we have to stop clinging to it. We have to stop insisting to ourselves that we need anything external for a calm and peaceful mind. The Buddha taught consistently that every human being needs four things. He didn't say we don't need anything. He said every, every human being needs four things, but they're basically easily acquired. They don't need a lot of attention. Every human being needs food, shelter, medicine, and clothing. We get caught up. Once we have one suit, we want to have two. Once we have three bagels in the, in the bin, we want six. Once we have a piece of chocolate cake, we want two chocolate cakes. That's the nature of it. Once we have a, a mind that is constantly craving is never satisfied. I had a great talk with, with one of you. And we talked just that this is the essence of the problem is always wanting more. A self-referential ego self is never satisfied. It's always trying to establish itself in the next thought, word, and deed. Always grasping after self-establishments. That's why these dharmas of, of resolution in non-physical realms are so prevalent. Because it follows that way of thinking. How am I going to establish myself? Okay, I can understand that I don't have the right view of things and I'm not chanting enough. So let me chant myself into a realm of nothingness. And because I believe that's my salvation, I'll continue to do it. Despite a lifetime of distraction from it. Buddha continues, the relinquishment of all the relinquishment of all acquisitions, the ending of craving. Imagine living your life moment by moment without craving for anything, without the need for anything. Some people will say, well, what's going to motivate you? What will motivate you? Wisdom. 
rather than fear, rather than grasping, rather than greed, aversion, and deluded thinking, it's wisdom that will get your butt off your chair and go to work. It's wisdom that will get your butt off your chair and come to a meditation class or anything else. The reason why I'm saying that is many people, when they first come to the Dhamma and start realizing the implication, have that thought, this sounds like annihilation. What's going to happen to me when I let go of all self-referential views? What's going to happen is you'll live in peace. But your outer life will likely look exactly the same. You might decide at some point to simplify your life as a consequence of your practice, but that's not a requirement. That's a natural unfolding. The ending of craving, the development of dispassion. Another word for dispassion is we, we stop personalizing everything because nothing is personal in the world. Nothing, except if we make it. The development of cessation, the development of unbinding. If I were to teach the Dhamma and others would not understand me, that would be tiresome for me and troublesome for me. The Buddha is now, excuse me, the Buddha is now going through an internal process of should I even teach this? And he's wrestling with himself because he knows how hard it was for him. And is there a way to teach human beings this, this Dhamma? How can I do it? And is it possible without wearing myself out? If I were to teach the Dhamma and others would not understand me, that would be tiresome for me, troublesome for me. Just then, this realization never known before occurred to me. In uh, nearly every um, recounting of this sutta, this scene takes place where a, a great Brahmin god comes down to the Buddha and asks him, tells him that it will be for humanity's long-term benefit. You must go out and teach. Please reconsider. Of course, we know <coughs> <coughs> from translating and interpreting the suttas correctly within the proper context that all of these um, external speculative fabricated beings are simply an aspect of our own thinking. <coughs> so Mara or this Brahmin here that comes in, it's really his, he's having a, an internal conversation within his, within his own thoughts. And they're just simply representative of a, uh, a confused, troublesome, conflicted mind meaning Mara is usually that, or a, having an internal conversation with a part of my thinking that is aware. So that's what this, that's what the Buddha is referring to. I just want to be clear about that. Um, just then this realization never known before occurred to me. I'll dismiss teaching. I'll, I'll dismiss teaching that which only with great difficulty I attain. This Dhamma is not easily realized by those overcome by greed, aversion, and delusion. This Dhamma is difficult to understand, subtle, deep, contrary to common belief. Those delighting in passion, their minds obscured in darkness, will not understand. And of course, this is how the Buddha is seeing the people in the world. How are they going to understand it? And now the Buddha is now using uh, in the sutta and i left it in the buddha is now using that brahma as a representative of his a, a clear aspect of his thinking then brahma Sam samapati became aware of my thoughts the world is lost destroyed the arahant the rightly self-awakened was one is inclined to dwelling in ease and not teaching his dhamma again look at this as the buddha is having this internal conversation with himself brahma samputi left his realm and came to me where would he come? Where would the realm come to me? You know, within his own consciousness. In the in the metaphor, he knelt on his right knee, bowed, and said, "Rightly self-awakened one, please teach your dhamma. Please teach your dhamma. There are those with just a little dust in their eyes. They are suffering because they will not hear your dhamma. With that, that little dust in your eyes, meaning they're they're ready to understand. They just need the right teaching. And it also shows that the Buddha didn't set out as a salva as a savior." He knew that he couldn't teach every, each and every human being this Dhamma. It was, it's only for those with a little bit of dust in your eyes. Congratulations. There are those that are able to understand your Dhamma. Brahma Sahampati continued, In the past, there appeared among the Magadans an impure Dhamma devised by the ignorant. He's just simply talking about all the other spiritual practices. 
Teacher Dhamma to end the pain of birth, of sickness, of aging, and death. Teacher Dhamma to end dukkha. Teacher Dhamma so they can also realize the unborn and the unexcelled release of the yoke, the unbinding. And the reason why I'm saying that, just to qualify it, the Buddha always referenced disincarnate non-physical beings as even if they were real, because the argument doesn't need to go, are they real or not? Even if they're real, they're just as stuck in delusion as we all are. Just because you're dead doesn't mean you're, you're instantly awakened. Just as one standing on a high peak might see people below, you, the wise one with profound vision, must take your place in the palace of the Dhamma. What a beautiful line. In other words, you, you've awakened, you understand it. You have a responsibility now. Free from suffering, look on these suffering oppressed with birth and aging. You have conquered ignorance. Be a great teacher and wander about, wander, wander without entanglements. Teach your Dhamma. There will be those who will understand. Mindful of Sahampati's plea and out of compassion for all beings, from my awakened state, I looked out onto the world. I saw beings with little dust in their eyes and beings with, with much. I saw uncluttered beings and dull beings. I saw beings with good qualities and beings with bad qualities. You know, this is another thing, and it kind of flies in the face of this idea that we should always, this positive thing, we should always think things in the most positive light and never look at the negative. Well, that, that's just another way of, of creating a speculative non-physical existence for you, isn't it, and within your mind, because dukkha occurs. The Buddha described that. There are unpleasant or so-called negative things that happen in, in life. To insist that everything must be positive is simply a way of continuing your own ignorance. And so the Buddha says, you need to look at these things realistically. They occur. I saw beings with good qualities and beings with bad qualities. I looked out onto the world and I saw beings hardened in their views, disgraced, in danger. I looked out onto the world and I saw those who would be easy to teach my understanding, my right view. Look out on the world right now, you would say exactly the same things. It is as if a pond is permeated with red, white, and blue lotus, born and growing immersed in the water. They flourish, permeated with cool water from their root to their tip, never standing above the surface. Even so, some might rise up and emerge from the murky water. Not every lotus blooms is what he's saying. Not every Dhamma practitioner, not every human being is going to bloom into awakening, just like the lotus. Seeing thus, I decided to teach my Dhamma, to open to the world the path to cessation, those with eyes to see and ears to hear could come forth in conviction. Those lacking the eyes to see or ears to hear, hear the pure Dhamma, I would not teach my refined and pure Dhamma. Rather than seeing himself as a savior and his Dhamma as salvific, he understand not everybody's going to get it. And I can only teach the people that are ready to hear it. And that makes sense, doesn't it? And in so in this way, the Buddha wouldn't be wasting his time teaching something to people that aren't ready to hear it, just like we do here. We don't get into a lot of other things. If you come here, you're here to learn the Buddha's Dhamma and not anything else. And it worked pretty well so far, hasn't it? Yes. Say yes. yes. <laughs> the Buddha continues. I, we're almost done. I would teach the pure Dhamma tirelessly and untroubled. In his mind, the Buddha says this, he concluded this with a, uh, a decision to go forward. Braham Samampati was, was pleased, he bowed and disappeared. Then the thought occurred to me, who should I first teach the Dharma to? Who will quickly understand? I thought of Alara Kalama, wise, intelligent, competent, but I heard that he had passed a week ago. I thought what a great loss it was to my friend Alara. He would have quickly learned my Dharma. Then I thought of Uddhaka Ramaputta. He too is wise, intelligent, competent, but I heard he had passed just last night. Excuse me. It was a great loss to my friend Uddhaka as well. He too would have quickly learned my Dhamma. And this points to something that is important and you know, reflects on how I teach and I talk about what it's not. We never lose respect for, for other Dharma simply because they're not ours, just like the Buddha did. He immediately knew that his teachers weren't giving him what he what he wanted, and yet he continued with great respect. And I saw I had a lot of great teachers over the years that never taught me the Dhamma, even though they were teaching Buddhism. And I still continue having great respect for them. And 
I think of a few of them very warmly. They were became great friends of mine, and they still are. So it's not disrespectful to say it's this and it's not that. It, it's simply wise. It's simply part of Dhamma practice. I then taught, thought of, I'm going to change that because it says taught. I then thought of the five friends I wandered with while attending to ascetic practices. I knew they were in the, in the deer park at Isipatana. It wasn't far from where the Buddha was. I took my leave to wander in stages to Isipatana. Along the way, I encountered Upaka, the, the uh, Ajavaka. <laughs> and actually this, even though I say that, and many people will say that his first discourse was to his five friends, this is really the Buddha's actual first teaching, someone he encountered on the road, Upaka the Ajivaka. He noticed my composure, my complexion bright. He inquired, on whose account have you gone forth? Who is your teacher? In whose Dhamma do you delight? I told Upaka that I have left the world behind through my own understanding, meaning leaving the world behind, meaning you're no longer entangled to the world through clinging and craving. I am released from all wrong views, from all phenomena. Empty of ignorance, I am free of craving. My realization is taught by none. To whom should I declare as my teacher? And it could sound almost arrogant, isn't it? But the Buddha is making a direct statement, hoping to impress Udaka. I'm someone you can listen to. I've done it. Udaka is not so sure. I have no teacher, as one like me cannot be found. I have no counterpart, for I am an arahant in the world. An arahant simply means an awakened human being. I am the unexcelled teacher. I am rightly self-awakened. The fires of passion are cool. He's describing the results of his Dhamma practice for all of us. I am unbound. I will set the wheel of the true Dhamma rolling. I am traveling to, to Kasi. In a world afflicted with the darkness of ignorance, I beat the drum of wisdom. Upaka replied, he wasn't too sure, from what you claim, you must be the ultimate conqueror. He's mocking Siddhartha now. The Buddha says, conquerors like me have abandoned greed, aversion, and delusion. I have conquered all evil qualities. You are correct, Upaka. I am a conqueror. Upaka, unconvinced, shaking his head, walked away. I continued to Deer Park. From afar, my five friends saw me. I was no longer gaunt from ascetic self-denial. Thinking that I was living luxuriously, they decided to not show me respect. As I approached them, they noticed my awakened state. Standing in respect, they took my robe and, and bowl and prepared a seat. One of my friends took a bowl and began to wash my feet. That's, simply, that's a sign of respect. It's still common today. I was wondering, I, I could use a good... <laughs> they, however, addressed me by my familiar name, a sign of disrespect. Friends do not address the Tathagata. Tathagata means the one who has gone forth and figured it out. Do not address the Tathagata, a rightly self-awakened one, in this way. I am rightly self-awakened. I am worth, a worthy one. I'm worthy of respect. Listen carefully, my friends. I have realized the unborn and the unexcelled release of the yoke, the unbinding. I will teach you my understanding. Practice as I instruct you, and shortly you will also realize the unborn and the unexcelled release of the yoke of ignorance, the unbinding. The group of five replied, from your pra practice of the austerities, you did not attain any superior, superior state or any higher knowledge. Excuse me. Or vision worthy of a noble one. So he, again, referring to that will gain release. The idea of that severe asceticism is that I'll punish my body so hard and so long that it will free my mind from my body. It's just the opposite of what the Buddha taught, isn't it? But that was that what they believed. And because they still believed that it was through asceticism that they would find understanding or release, they're telling the Buddha, you couldn't possibly have developed understanding because you're no longer an ascetic like them. Notice the self-referential view insisting that someone else must have that same view or they can't be teaching something worthwhile. It's just another way of continuing to ignore your own ignorance. How can you now, living luxuriously, just be, the Buddha's just started eating a little a reasonable diet, Living luxuriously, straying from your exertion and backsliding to abundance, have attained any superior state or any higher knowledge. That's another good example of how a mind in ignorance will exaggerate what they're seeing. 
they actually saw the, the Buddha as living this luxurious, abundant life when all he was doing was taking a little more food than he was before and not walking around naked. He put on robes again. A mind rooted in ignorance will exaggerate what they're seeing to prove the point to themselves, to take this, this good versus evil view. Their friend, the Siddhartha, was now an evil one because he's given in to what they're seeing as greed, even though he was living a very simple, practical life. That's how the mind works. We do it all the time. Look at the world today. We keep throwing all these lies about other people out there and hoping them that they stick. Let me go back. Straying from your exertion and backsliding into abundance have attained any superior state or any higher knowledge or vision worthy of a noble one. The Buddha replied, I, the Tathagata, is not, I am, I am not living luxuriously or strayed from my exertion or backslided into abundance. The Tathagata is a worthy one, rightly self-awakened. Listening carefully, I have realized the unborn state and the unexcelled release of the yoke, the unbinding. I will teach you my understanding. Practice as I instruct you. Again, he's repeating himself. And you will also realize the unborn and the unexcelled release of the yoke. I've been talking too much tonight. The unbinding for yourselves right here and now. A second and a third time they doubted me and questioned me in the same manner. I then asked them, have I ever claimed to be a rightly self-awakened one before? You have never claimed to be a rightly self-awakened one. I replied again, the Tathagata is not living luxuriously or strayed from his exertion or backslided into abundance. The Tathagata is a, a, is a worthy one, rightly self-awakened. Listen carefully. I have realized the unborn and the unexcelled release of the yoke, the unbinding. I will teach you my understanding. He's, he's emphasizing this over and over again to try to get past their present ignorance. Practice as I instruct you, and shortly you will realize the unborn and the unexcelled release of the yoke, the unbinding. He's pleading with his friends here almost. Listen to me. I have what you've been looking for, what we've all been looking for. You can find this for yourself right here and now. And so I convinced them of my knowledge and wisdom. Over time, living on alms, I instructed the group of five, being subject themselves to birth, to sickness, to aging, to death, to dukkha, to greed, to aversion, to delusion, and now understanding the suffering of dukkha and of greed and aversion, they attained the unborn and the unexcelled release of the yoke, the unbinding. Let me just finish this. Friends, craving and clean arises from the five senses. Forms known from the eye, agreeable, pleasing, enticing, enchanting, are linked to the to sensual desire. Sounds known from the ear, agreeable, pleasing, enticing, enchanting, are linked to sensual desire. Aromas known from the nose, agreeable, pleasing, enticing, enchanting, are linked to sensual desire. Tastes known from the tongue, agreeable, pleasing, enticing, enchanting, are linked to sensual desire. Tactile sensations known from the body, agreeable, pleasing, enticing, and chanting are linked to sensual desire. This is the craving and clinging that arises from the five senses. So in, uh, not to get into it, we'll get into it more next week. In the process, in the progression from ignorance to suffering, right in the middle of that process, is fabricated views leading to thinking, leading to contact, and it's contact with the external world that is interpreted through our senses, isn't it? Our five physical senses and that sixth sense of consciousness. And so this, this vehicle that is now interpreting what's occurring in the world through these senses that are rooted in a fabricated or, or corrupted view can only interpret them from that point of view. Is that clear? Yeah. And it is at that point of contact with our senses that the Dhamma is practiced. So our senses aren't good or bad. If, they're root, if we're using our senses from a mind rooted in ignorance, they're going to cause suffering. But those very same senses are the key to awakening. By seeing life as life unfolds from a dispassionate, impersonal way. And how would we do that? But through our senses. But our senses now married through thinking that is rooted in wisdom rather than ignorance. It all occurs within us. This is the craving and clinging that arises from the five senses. 
Any complaint contemplative, any Brahmin, any seeker who clings to sensuality in this manner, infatuated and enchanted with sensuality, without understanding, without understanding the suffering that follows, or the path to cessation, should be known as truly unfortunate in having met ruin. They have lost their minds and the world will have its way with them. It is as if a wild deer were caught in a heap of snares. This deer has met misfortune and ruin. The metaphor is towards the entanglement that we create for ourselves in the world. We create that snare. A hunter could do with, with them whatever they will. In the same manner, any contemplative, any Brahmin, any seeker who clings to sensuality in this manner, meaning any spiritual seeker, in this manner, infatuated and enchanted with sensuality without understanding the suffering that follows or the path to the cessation should be known as truly unfortunate in having that ruin. They have lost their minds and the world will have its way with them. I'm not sure whose mic that is. Nah, we're going to have to live with that. Now, know this, friends. Any contemplative, any Brahmin, any seeker, meaning any spiritual, anybody on a path, who no longer clings to sensuality in this manner, not infatuated or enchanted with sensuality, understanding the suffering of the I'm sorry. Clap your hands. Clap your hands. Hold on. Hey, Ron, could you turn your mic off, please? Okay. Um, Thank you. I, I can if that. you. I think I can. Um, <laughs> I'll turn it back on in a minute. Uh, in this manner, not infatuated or enchanted with sensuality, understanding the suffering that follows craving and clinging, and the path to cessation should be known as truly fortunate and will not meet ruin. They have control of their minds, and the world will not have its way with them. It is as if a wild deer avoided a hunter's snares. This deer has not met misfortune and has avoided ruin. A hunter cannot do with them what they will. In the same manner, any contemplative, any Brahmin, any seeker who does not cling to sensuality in this manner is not infatuated or enchanted with sensuality, who understands the suffering that follows craving and clinging, and the path to cessation should be known as truly fortunate and will not meet ruin. They have control of their minds and the world will not have its way with them. We have control of our minds and the world won't have our way with them. Pretty good deal. It is as if a wild deer living carefree in all ways. Why is it carefree? Because, it's, because it has gone beyond the hunter's range. That's the, that's the protection that comes from Dhamma practice. In the same way, those engaged in a noble search, established in seclusion, established free of sensuality and unskillful mental qualities, enter and remain in the first jhana. This first jhana is experienced as rapture born of that very seclusion. It is accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. They have become lost to Mara, meaning they have been, be, become lost to their ignorance in their own mind. Furthermore, those engaged in the noble search and to remain in the second jhana. This second jhana, this is simply an ever-deepening concentration, is experienced as rapture and pleasure born of concentration, free of directed thought and evaluation. With internal assurance, internal poise, the joy of concentration permeates their entire mind and body. They have, and this points directly to where is this taking place? Where is concentration developed? Again, within us. They have become lost to Mara, meaning lost to the effects of wrong views. Furthermore, those engaged in the noble search and to remain in the third jhana, which is equanimous and mindful, a pleasant abiding. With the fading of rapture, this pleasant abiding permeates their entire mind and body. They have become lost to Mara. Furthermore, those engaged in the noble search and to remain in the fourth jhana, which is pure equanimity and mindful. Being pure, neither pleasure nor pain is seen. They sit permeated in mind and body, a mind united with this body, in pure bright awareness. They have become lost to Mara. And further still, those engaged in a noble search with complete abandonment of self-identification to form, this is right to the heart of the matter, complete abandonment of self-identification to form, with the fading of aversion, with the cessation of craving here and there, 
they enter and remain in a dimension of infinite space. Now, the Buddhist, this is not a progression. The Buddha is talking about common beliefs of their time, and he's simply referencing them. And you'll see as this concludes to say those are just, those are simply just another fabricated existence. He could have easily have brought these before he started talking about John. It's just a progression. progression excuse me. They have become lost to Mara. And further still, those engaged in a noble search with complete abandonment, with a dimension of infinite space. First, where, the, where it's taught that people strive for it, what the Buddha is saying, abandon that search. With a complete abandonment of the dimension of infinite space, they enter and remain in dimension of infinite consciousness. So he's simply describing the grasping realms, the grasping after realms that a mind that has continued in ignorance will, will continue until they understand. They have become, reaching for those realms, they have become lost. And further still, those engaged in the noble search with complete abandonment of the dimension of infinite consciousness, they enter and remain in the dimension of nothingness. It's almost nine o'clock, so I, the Buddha continues through a few other dimensions, knowing that he's simply saying, the, all these speculative realms that you have aspired to and hope to acquire, they're all fabricated. Let them all go. Just give me a moment to get to the conclusion. Free of reaction, knowledge and wisdom well established, greed, aversion, and delusion are completely overcome. They have become lost to Mara, meaning they've been lost to ignorance. Having engaged in a noble search, they are unattached to anything in the world or any fabricated view. They are as carefree as a deer, far removed from a hunter's range. Why are, they, why are they as carefree as a deer removed from a hunter's range? Because they have completed the noble search, and through their own efforts, they have gone beyond Mara's reach. They have gone beyond the reach of ignorance. Those who have engaged in a noble search who have completed the Eightfold Path are said to be rightly self-awakened. This is what the great teacher said. The group of five were delighted from hearing these words. <laughs> Sorry for the long sutta. Um, it's important that we get through them all uh, for a lot of reasons. But one is, to this firmly establishes the Buddha's search, what he awakened to, and why he taught what he taught. If that's not completely clear to all of you right now, it will become. This is this is an important sutta to keep in mind, though, as it really lays the foundation. <coughs> Excuse me. Since it's just nine o'clock, um, it's really not time to go around the room. Uh, but I want to. Does anybody have any questions that they need answered right now, or any any comments you want to make? Let's give ourselves a few full, a few minutes to conclude this class. So, any questions or comments? Nothing. Okay, I'm going to go around the room and find out. Just kidding. How about you, Ram, or, uh, or Jane? Good. Any questions? We're good? Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, Nick. In the, in, you know, one of the things you use, you use the word popular. That popular? Popular. Uh -huh. and, and that uh, Buddha would not be interested in Mm -hmm. Wasn't he popular? Yeah, but I'm sorry, I don't, it, it doesn't mean that just because something is popular, it shouldn't be followed, but because it's popular doesn't mean that it's necessarily useful. That's all. I mean, he, the teachers that he mentioned, he studied with many other teachers, were the popular teachers of his time. He still held, held great respect for them. It, what it, like, again, what it, what it means is just because something is popular, just because a lot of people are doing it, doesn't mean that it's necessarily useful. So come, so come and experience it. So as, as popular as the Buddha's Dhamma was, he didn't say, follow me just because it's popular. He says, ahead the Sikha, this is what you have to do. In fact, he said that often. He said, don't, don't follow it because of me or my friends. Follow it because it works. And that's a significant difference, isn't it? It's a great question you asked. I hope I answered it. Good. Now, that, is, that is so important. <laughs> um, we, we follow the Dhamma because it brings results. Okay, it's gotten late. I think we should include the class. <laughs>
Uh, and most, uh, those of you, most of our classes won't go this, this late, but this was important to get this whole thing in. Um, Saturday, uh, and this, again, this is an ongoing course. Each class leads to the next. Saturday's class talk is on dependent origination. I know you're all very busy, but I would encourage you to come as many, to as many classes as you can. And if you can't come to a class, try to catch up and you know, listen to it. They're all on the website. <laughs> this will be posted at, at the latest in 24 hours. Usually I get to it you know, when I get home. So. Um, and the other thing is that our retreat is coming up, I think, in seven weeks or so. Um, those that have been on retreat know that there's no way to um, further your Dhamma practice, but four days on the retreat. If you, if you can make it, please do so and sign up as soon as you can. We conclude, as we always do, with the Karaniya Metta Sutta. So again, find your relaxed meditation mm -hmm. posture. Gently close your eyes. Gently close your mouth. And take a moment to become mindful of your in-breath and your out-breath. And these are the Buddha's words on Metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short, or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state, let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desire, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class tonight. Peace. You, See you, Ram. See you, Jane. Thanks, John. Have a good week. You too. Bye, John. See you, Ram. <laughs>